IoT, powering the digital economy. Brought to you by Schneider Electric. age of global transformation, the importance of education can't be overstated. It's the foundation of our achievements and of everything we aspire to. As Benjamin Franklin once said, an investment in knowledge pays the best interest. Change in education may have often gone hand in hand, but over the past few years, a rise in digital teaching methods has started to truly revolutionize the sector. Educational technology, or edtech, is one of the fastest growing business sectors in the world today, incorporating a dizzying array of learning platforms and online teaching tools. By 2020, the edtech industry as a whole is projected to be worth a cool $93 billion. Digital innovations like cloud-based tuition are opening up new frontiers. So what does the edtech revolution really mean for a complex sector like education? And how will all this new technology benefit teachers, learners and businesses alike? In this program, we'll be looking at how the big players in the world of education are adapting in the digital arena. And what about the new organizations riding the surge in edtech investment? How are they using digital breakthroughs to increase their consumer reach and disrupt the market? I'll also be meeting with an edtech expert to find out about future developments and regulations in the sector. The full pace of change in edtech has led many educators and institutions to take the ball by the horn. All over the world, schools, universities and colleges are racing to digitize their services. With a global reputation in teaching and research, the Imperial College Business School in London is a world leader in the field. Their internationally recognized edtech laboratory is a hotbed of digital innovation. Professor Francisco Veloso is Dean at Imperial College Business School. Previously, he was the Dean at Catholica Lisbon School of Business and Economics, where he held the chair in innovation and entrepreneurship. He firmly believes that uniting technology and business is the key to successful innovation. Francisco, how is Imperial College Business School embracing innovation and edtech? I think embracing is the right word because we when the technology started to appear, we really believed that it was going to be part of the future of business education. And so we made a very significant investment in it. For, for over five years, we've been investing in this, working with it, and trying to take it to the next level. But what are the biggest challenges that have come with that uh, edtech rollout? Well, there are multiple challenges. Um, and uh, certainly there's the technological part itself, because developing a platform that really allows you to engage with the students is a difficult thing to do, and so we've been investing a lot on that part. The second challenge is, is a behavioral one. I mean, professors are used to delivering their classes in a certain way, with a certain touch. They've done that, some of them, over you know, decades. And the third element is the students themselves, getting the students comfortable and realizing that this is not about taking out the human element or making it cheap or anything like that, that this is really about a different learning environment. The school's commitment to this new learning environment has led to the development of their world-famous EdTech Lab, an award-winning educational technology team led by founder and director, Dr. David Lefebvre. We've been running the EdTech Lab here at Imperial College Business School since about 2005. And um, we do two things. We build online courses, um, a lot of them, about 180, which we deliver to our students and to um, the general public. And we do a lot of um, R&D into how to make education um, improved using technology. And the driving philosophy is basically that we think technology can enhance education in a very significant way. All of our students have access to online courses, and I think they initially approach it as some trepidation. You know, they, um, they perceive it as perhaps they're being shortchanged or that they're getting access to something which is somehow inferior. 
Um, but once they take the courses, they become converted and um, they see the value in them. Are there any current uh, developments that are having the greatest impact on the industry? The major trend that's happening in, in higher education, the one that's going to have the greatest impact, is the digitisation of courses. Because step one is that education needs to be digitised. If you're going to realise the advantages of technologies, then that really needs to happen. And that's really just starting now. So that's the major trend. And over the next four or five years, we'll see an increasing amount of um, higher education be digitised. And that brings with it all kinds of advantages. The exciting new tech that everybody's talking about is AI, AI and big data. Um, and these will certainly have um, a significant impact in a relatively short time frame. The power of big data is already being explored at Imperial College in their state-of-the-art data observatory. Developed in partnership with KPMG, it's a 64-screen data visualization studio and decision-making space. As a teaching resource, it's having a big impact with academics and businesses alike. Gentlemen, this is clearly EdTech in action. And David, what exactly does this do? So this is a space that helps us to explore data with students uh, and bring them through a data-driven a data -driven journey understanding the insights uh, of our research. How exactly do you use this to teach? So a common practice in business schools is actually to use uh, business cases. So what we did here is actually load a bunch of data about organizations and we just displayed it into uh, a specific problem uh, that it's a big problem right now, How uh, organizations are going to be affected by artificial technology. So what we loaded here is a bunch of cases that we can now uh, interactively teach uh, students uh, about how these new technologies are affecting their organization. And we can see here actually different scenarios that are going to change dynamically or actually zoom in into different data about the different uh, parts of the organization. Mathematics, science, technology, the arts. In education, all disciplines are vital to global progress. But for our economies to thrive in this digital age, we need a workforce versed in computer science. Schools of today need to nurture our coders, programmers, and engineers of the future. But digital resources don't come cheap, and many institutions around the world struggle to provide their students with the equipment that they need to stay in the game. I've come to Cambridge, a famous and well-established seat of international learning where one organisation is creating a landslide in edtech by producing and distributing computers for about the price of a cup of coffee. Philip Colligan is CEO of Raspberry Pi Foundation, a UK-based charity dedicated to putting computing power into the hands of people all over the world. Philip was formerly chief executive of the innovative charity Nesta, where he created the Innovation Lab, which continues to deliver dozens of programs supporting digital innovation in public services, healthcare, and government. Raspberry Pi computers start from as little as $5. So this is a Raspberry Pi computer. Okay, wow. um, this is our top of the range model. That's a $35 computer. You put the SD card in just here and that gives you your operating system and memory. Okay. And then you can plug this into your TV, that's okay. HDMI, your keyboard and mouse mm -hmm. in here. Mm -hmm. This one already has Wi-Fi and Bluetooth on board. Uh, and then you plug in power and you're good to go. And this one? And so this is the Raspberry Pi Zero W. So this is one of our lower cost devices. This is $10. And I think in, in total, we've sold about a million of these products now. Global sales of Raspberry Pi computers have topped 17 million. And the original mission of Raspberry Pi was to create a device that would help young people learn how to program. Um, but what we've actually done is created a computer that's used in industry, it's used by hobbyists and grown-ups, but it's also used all over the world in education. And you can do anything with it that you can do with any other computer. So you can surf the internet, you can send emails, you can watch movies on YouTube, but you can also create, make things. You can learn how to program, you can build robots, make weather stations. The opportunities are limitless. And I can imagine that this is having a big impact on education around the world. Yeah, so one of, our, one of the things we're trying to achieve is to remove price as a barrier to anybody having high-powered compute. Um, and that's uh, transformational in education. So what it means is that schools, but also outside of schools, like clubs and at home, kids can get access to a computer that's theirs. And how do you integrate your business into the corporate world, especially given that you're a foundation? 
So for the foundation, around half of what we spend on our educational programs comes from our trading activity, and about half comes from grants and donations and sponsorship from some of the biggest technology companies in the world. And that's partly because their staff feel such a strong sense of connection to our community. And they volunteer at our code clubs, they take part in our code dojos. And so, yeah, we have a great relationship with the technology companies. You mentioned code clubs. Can you tell us a little bit more about those? Yeah, so we have two networks of after school and weekend coding clubs, uh, Code Club and Code Dojo. Um, all together, I think we've got something like 13,000 of those across the world now, uh, engaging something like 200,000 kids a week. But they've created some of the most amazing projects with Raspberry Pi. Uh, last year, we had our big showcase over in Dublin, and I met a young girl from Romania who had made a mind-controlled robot using a Raspberry Pi. And there was this great moment when I put the sensor on my head, and within 10 minutes, I programmed it to go forwards, backwards, left, and right. And this is a young girl who uh, attends a Coda Dojo at the local university, 13 years old, creating amazing things with technology. Just mind-blowing. Oh, wow. Yeah, it's super cool. Putting digital creativity into the hands of everyone has to be a good thing. But the growth of edtech can bring with it other concerns. Streams of data are essential for effective modern teaching. Much of it is sensitive and much of it concerns young and sometimes vulnerable learners. After the break, I'll be meeting an industry expert to find out how we can regulate this revolution in education. New technologies are changing the way we think about learning in the 21st century and more and more educational bodies are taking up the challenge, utilising digital to transform the way they teach. Bainbridge Island is a school district in Seattle that's fully embraced the technological revolution with a mission and vision to improve learning by providing technology to the 4,000 students in the district. In partnership with the community, the district provides digital classroom environments that allow their students to thrive in creative and relevant ways. The ambition for EdTech um, in the Bainbridge Island School District is really about our kids. What we're doing is we're preparing our students for the future, specifically in the areas of critical thinking, collaborating um, across multiple platforms, um, thinking creatively. Those are the things that are going to empower our students to be prepared for the future and not just live in the world, but actually lead in the future as well. EdTech is allowing students to approach topics on a personal level. It gives students the ability to choose things that they're passionate about, and it makes the learning much more engaging. Bringing about a sea change in digital education across an entire school district needs a reliable infrastructure, especially in an area prone to power outages. Loss of power could also mean a loss of valuable data and a serious disruption to learning. Bainbridge Island uses services by Schneider Electric to constantly monitor the 35 data closets in the area, helping to ensure an uninterrupted flow of information. So if there's a power outage, classrooms can continue to operate. Education is fundamentally changing. Traditional methods of teaching are being transformed by breakthroughs in digital technology. As the use of edtech in the education sector continues to grow, so does the need to regulate the enormous flow of data involved. I have come to University College London's Knowledge Lab, where a team of academics are answering some of the biggest questions in education and technology. Professor Rose Luckin has been developing and writing about the learning sciences, edtech and artificial intelligence for over 20 years. She's also an international advisor on digital futures and the design and use of edtech. Now, it's always sensitive when you're making use of data, especially data that has to do with uh, children or students. Where can international regulations help? Well, that's a really interesting area, and it's a very fast-moving area at the moment. We handle it very, very carefully. Every time in a university you collect data about somebody, you go through an ethical procedure. That's not necessarily the case in the commercial world. Now, that's where these new regulations for EU but also for data that's going from the EU outside of the EU will make a difference because people will have to adhere to the regulations and therefore there will be greater security and privacy of data, including children's data, very importantly. There's a new element to these regulations that is about people needing to understand what their data is being used for and having a right to an explanation 
Are we at risk of turning education into a commodity? Yes, I think we are at risk of turning education into a commodity. And I think technology does play to that risk because sometimes we forget the learner who should be at the centre of what we're doing. Even if what we're talking about with the technology is a technology that's designed for teachers, it's still the learner who is the person we want to benefit. Because all we're really trying to achieve through whatever technology and human means when it comes to education is for people to understand more, to learn. The data security part at, at Imperial is, is very important. I mean, not only we take uh, data protection very seriously, I mean, we've had a strong internal effort to make sure that uh, uh, we are fully compliant with the data protection rules that are uh, now coming on place, and we think we are even ahead of that, but we are making sure that that is the case. At Imperial, we have an institute precisely for um, you know, security uh, that deals with a lot of these issues, and, and it's one of um, the, what we call the global challenges that Imperial has taken on that involves all the faculties uh, so that would be the business school, you know, the faculty of engineering, the faculty of natural sciences, and also the medical school. We're very careful with, with the way that we, we, we manage the data for students. Are there any uh, specific regulations that uh, your company or your business has to satisfy? Well, there's a whole set of regulations, of course, around product and being able to sell product all over the world. That's something that our trading company thinks pretty hard about because we produce something that in many ways is a, you know, a standard product. It's a computer. And of course, there's all sorts of regulations around the world about um, how you make sure those are up to standard. Um, but we, we comply with all of those. How do you keep to those standards, especially given that you know, your product is one that's used internationally? So we work with some great partners. Um, we work with RS and Farnell, uh, and we have a production partner um, uh, in Sony. Um, we, we create Raspberry Pis, we make Raspberry Pis in the Sony factory in South Wales. So we work with an incredibly strong network of partners who are all over those issues. Of course, uh, data and the safety of data is, is a big uh, issue in the sector. Uh, what are your thoughts on that in regards to how data is being handled? Well, so there's major challenges, obviously, uh, around data and how that is being treated. Um, I think in education, it's enormously important that we educate kids about what's happening to their data. Um, we think that one of the reasons why you help young people learn about computers and how to make things with computers is so that they're a more informed citizen, so that they know what companies are able to do with their data and they can take better choices. And then, of course, for the foundation, we have over 200,000 young people a week involved in our activities, so we care a lot about safeguarding and making sure that every space that we have for young people is safe and protected. Managing data will always be high on the EdTech agenda, but in a sector full of so many exciting opportunities and developments, what else does the future hold? After the break, I'll be looking at the cutting edge of EdTech innovation and finding out about the teaching of tomorrow. Education is facing a rapidly rising tide of digital innovation. Educators, startups and tech giants are all competing to devise new tools and platforms, transforming the traditional learning landscape. Artificial intelligence may appear to be an attractive proposition, but applying this cutting-edge technology to education isn't without its challenges, as Professor Rose Luckin of the UCL Knowledge Lab knows only too well. How do we get people to understand artificial intelligence a little better? Because AI is completely different from edtech, so in a way that needs its own training. Absolutely. I think the conversation about what artificial intelligence can and can't do is fundamentally important for all educators. And what people need to understand in order to use that effectively is that machine learning is very good at crunching lots and lots of data and coming up with a decision, either finding a specific sentence in a document or matching a photograph to an image. But what machine learning is not currently able to do is to explain the decisions that it's making. So educators need to know that. We will develop systems that can do that. There's a whole initiative in the US around explainable artificial intelligence, but at the moment that's an area where we're not so good. Teachers particularly need to know how valuable their social interaction skills are, their emotional intelligence is, because again, that's something artificial intelligence can't do. For Philip Colligan of Raspberry Pi, it's important that the children of today understand the tools that are driving their learning. 
Well, so I think it's massively important as technology is advancing so quickly that we're able to engage kids in learning about it. And it is entirely possible for kids to learn about uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence in a very rudimentary way when they're pretty young. And what's important there is not only learning the technical skills, but also that they're learning some of the ethical questions that are thrown up. So one of our projects last year, um, we partnered with Google um, to create a do-it-yourself Google Home Kit. And we gave it away free on the cover of our, ma of our magazine. Um, and what that meant was you could at home build a cardboard version, a uh, cardboard case, with a Google Home box that you'd built yourself with a Raspberry Pi. Now that's important because kids learn a whole load of technical skills about APIs and how voice, natural voice processing works, but also that they can start to think about the ethical questions about um, passive recording of uh, what people are saying in the home. Dr. David Lefebvre of the EdTech Lab is concerned about the balance between teachers and technology. Um, I mean, the major constraint in higher education, and I think perhaps education in general, is, that, is the lack of teachers. You know, we have huge demand for education and not enough people to, to teach what's, what's, what's required. Um, and so everybody's searching for ways in which teachers can be augmented. You know, technology that enable teachers to teach more students. And AI is, um, is, is one possible technology to solve this problem. That sounds like a good solution, but at the same time, it also takes away jobs of teachers. What about the social impact? I think the problem we're facing is, is a lack of teachers. And so um, you know, I think we're a very long way from um, teachers losing their jobs. And I think in, in business schools, at least, we, we face another dilemma, which is that if AI can teach a skill, then it can probably do that skill as well. And so um, this, the skills that are taught by AI are probably the ones that are going to be outsourced to machines in future. And they're probably not the kind of skills we want to teach in business schools. We want to prepare our students for success and, uh, and personal growth. What about students and how they're taking this in? You know, the, the use of artificial intelligence um, and how it can change the way they learn. I mean, the message coming from our students is very clear. They want access to human teachers. All of us see the value in being tutored and, and being mentored. And we recently did a research um, project into this. And we're looking at the, you know, the, the gen next generation of students that's coming up. They're very tech savvy. They're used to um, working online. But conversely, what they really value is access to humans who are going to mentor them, coach them, teach them life skills. So I think there's a place for both. And what we're really facing is what's the balance between human and machine. But what about the schools and universities of the future? How do the educators and innovators of today see the classrooms of tomorrow? Well, that is a good question. The school of the future. I think one of the things that's going to be true in the school of the future is that it will have more spaces where kids can create with technology. There will be more project-based learning. So kids might be um, pursuing a passion of theirs and building something maybe to solve a social problem. And what they'll do is learn a whole load of skills like resilience and collaboration around that project, but they'll also be learning deep technical skills. I think that's going to be much more uh, a, a part of the schools of the future. In the university of the future, I really see a big combination of digital and physical. So that means that probably the way that the professors or the tutors work with the students is going to be different. It's going to be more about coaching. It's going to be about directing their learning so that they say, oh, there's all these courses you can do even online here. But have you thought about doing this one rather than the other one? I think it fits better. I think it's going to be much more of a continuum from things that are going to be fully uh, physical, like a lab, a chemistry lab. You can't put that digitally. That will have to be done here. Two things that are fully digital. The more progressive universities will make that transition, will make that adaptation. And if they're not, I mean, I, I'm a professor of entrepreneurship, and I think that if the universities don't do that, I think new universities will appear and will do that. I, mean, I think what we'll see is we'll see um, the merging of the physical and the virtual space, this, this idea of blended learning. So we'll have a more flexible um, approach to education. You know, students will choose whether they study online or whether they study face-to-face. -face. Um, we'll see improved outcomes due to the use of technology such as AI leading to more personalised user journeys, greater aspect of feedback. So what we'll see is um, greater access to education education in a more flexible way, and education having a much larger impact because of technology. If the goal of education is to make us lifetime learners, then EdTech holds the golden promise of faster, more efficient learning, 
and online accreditation with accessible teaching on every subject under the sun. Providing we can blend in the traditional, safely manage our data and keep up with the flow of information, then EdTech just might be our greatest ally on the journey through the digital domain. IOT, powering the digital economy. Brought to you by Schneider Electric.